importance of building culture is super simple. It doesn't make a difference if you build it or if you don't, it's happening. Whenever you feel fear, that's where you You've got to become the this. person that will attract over 200 different cognitive biases. The real work in any business is thinking. What is up, everybody? Today is going to be a blast. Today we have Selena. And just before we dive in, I want to let you know, if you could just hit that subscribe button, it would mean the world to us. Back to you, Code. Awesome, man. Well, and guys, we are so excited because we have Celine Williams on the show today. Now, for those of you who don't know her, Celine is an executive coach and culture strategist who helps leaders navigate within their own organizations how to improve higher performance. So, uh, she's just a wealth of wisdom. We have some amazing questions that we would love to chat with her about. Um, and Celine, how's it going? How's how's everything going up in Canada? It's going well. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. This is I love that there's two co-hosts. This is like this is my jam. I'm really into we this. We have fun. Yeah, we yeah. have so much yeah. fun here. We, <laughs> we like to do this first awesome fun thing, just to kind of a little icebreaker, if you will. Are you ready? I'm as ready as I'm ever going to be. That's the best answer. Okay, here it goes. So. First question, if you had to babysit one of these two individuals, would it be Curious George or Nemo from Finding Nemo? Nemo. Ooh, why? Mm. Uh, because immediacy. I have more context for Nemo as someone who does not have children. I have not read a Curious George book since I was a kid. So Nemo, I feel like I understand Nemo better than Curious George at this point in my life. Fair enough. Really? Fair enough. Really? Okay. Um, if you had to deal with it, would you rather be lost at sea with all the proper gear or lost in the desert with all the proper gear? Lost at sea. Ooh. Ooh that is interesting. I would have wow. said the I'm intrigued. Very, very. I, I enjoy boats and I would not be mad at falling asleep to the sound of like waves against a boat every single night. I am, I'm good with that. <laughs> That's okay. awesome. Okay. All right. If you, if you were going to a party, would you take Harry Potter or Ron or Ron Weasley with you? Ron Weasley. Hello. <laughs> Who yes. is going to be more fun at the party? That. Ron Weasley. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Obviously feel... Ron. Yeah, you're right. You're not, yeah. you're not wrong about that, it. That's a giveaway. Um, this is a fun one. If you knew that you would be guaranteed totally safe, would you rather ride a T-Rex or ride a dragon? Dragon. Yeah, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. The flying dragons 100%. Are my, yeah, dragons are my yeah. favorite animal. I get that. Yeah. And then the final question. If you had a chance to go back into time, who would you go spend time with back in time? Oh, this is... See, when you give me such a broad scope of things, who would I go and spend time with? I think I might go spend time with Catherine the Great. Ooh, that's good. Because that's really good. that is a woman who <laughs> changed some stuff up in Russia in a massive way at a time when it no was kidding. really impossible for women to do that. And I feel like getting a glimpse into the way her mind worked and how she did that would be fascinating. Mm. Yeah, totally. That's what a beautiful answer. I love that. Right? Awesome. That is fantastic. Uh, so we're right off of that. Actually, we're just going to dive right in here. Um, Let's do it. What is your story? How did you get to where you are? And with that, I'm going to throw a second question on here. What is your purpose? Why do you do what you do? How did you get where you are? And why do you do what you do? Um, so like so many entrepreneurs, my story is a long and winding road. What is that Cheryl Crow song? Every day is a winding road. Sometimes I feel like that is the story of becoming an entrepreneur for a lot of people. Um, yeah, totally. but mine certainly, mine certainly was, I, um, was an entrepreneur when I was, I started my first business when I was late teens, early, like 1920. So I always say late teens, early twenties, but around there I started my first business. It was a tutoring company. Um, I also worked for a tutoring company, but I specialized in what I did and I created a specific program. So in my mid twenties, I actually sold that IP to a competing tutoring company because I was moving out of the, out of Ontario. I was moving to a different city. Um, so that was my first real taste of running a business pre, you know, smartphones, pre any technology support. This was like a lot of me typing and printing off things. And I liked having control of my own schedule. Mm. Um, and I was, you know, there's lots of things I didn't do well, but uh, it was fun. Um, but I, I, while I was doing that, I actually got, um, the offer to work in a recently funded kind of startup space, um, for three months. It was supposed to be a three month contract. And I was like, 
you know, 23 years old. This is me recently graduated, you know, two years out of university, whatever it is, and got this offer. And I was like, I mean, I've never worked in an office. That sounds amazing. So, uh-huh. so I did that for 11 years. Wow. That's so, a commitment. Dedication. Yeah. Oh my yeah. I really, I had the world's longest three month contract, just so we're all clear. World's yep. long. I think I have a world <laughs> record. Um, but it was great and challenging. Have you for a lot submitted of different it to the Guinness World Book of Records? <laughs> it should. It really should. Um, it was great and challenging. I learned a lot from it. I got to travel all around Canada as a result of it. I got to work with some of the absolute most incredible leaders that despite the culture of the organization I was in really showed me what being a leader and caring for your people was all about. Oh my. Um, and when I wasn't mm, working for yeah, them, yeah, yeah. I was like, this sucks when I'm not working for them. Like this is, Mm. this culture is terrible. And I didn't use the word culture. Mm. I was just like, I hate my job. Like, you know, every 30 something or 20 something, I hate my job. Um, And I left. So I started training as a coach while I was there. Knew I wanted to do something that was helping people. When I started university, I thought I was actually going to be a a therapist. My goal was to be a psychiatrist. Mm. So coaching was like, the future focused version of that. Cause it's yeah. all about getting into people and mm. people's brains. And I love, 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 love people's brains. So you might've guessed you that. My Catherine, get along. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my Catherine, the great answer, right? I'm like, I want to be in her head. I, this, is, <laughs> this is all I want. Mm. Um, so left that company thinking I was going to be a coach in the same space that that company had been in, like in the, so- the same sort of uh, industry, mm. hated that ran through all my savings in the first year and a half and then was like, Oh, I should probably maybe think about this differently. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's when I started really talking about realizing putting the pieces together is, is is probably the best way to put it. So I started putting pieces together that the thing that I saw in that company that I found frustrating was culture and a lack of transparent leadership. Mm -hmm. And what could I do with my coaching? And like, I had a background in sociology and I had a background in change management. What can I do inside of this that can influence those things? Wow. And that's where I really started focusing on um, culture design and doing it specifically and intentionally, no matter the size of the company, because you can always do it. It is a, it's a process, but it's always a process. Mm. Um, And, you know, working with leaders that are people focused and, transparent and, and relational. And how can I support that and those teams to do more of that and put more of that into the world? So that's kind of my story and my purpose in one, right? Like Mm -hmm. I, the best way I've, I have yet of summing up my purpose is that I'm really driven to create spaces in the world where people can show up as the best version of themselves, no matter Mm -hmm. what that is on a day-to-day basis because we're all constantly changing. And so the best version of myself tomorrow, if I've had a really crappy night and I'm dealing with a lot of stuff, might not be the same thing as the best version of myself today, but I wanna create spaces where that's okay and people are supported, whatever that looks like. That's amazing. Come super, on, super, I love that good. answer. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know, as far as leadership goes, um, I guess I have a couple of questions with that. The first one is, this, you know, what does a great leader look like to you what does that look like? And then what are some of the attributes that you think leaders need to have uh, to develop being gr- a great leader? I think that answers this. There's going to be a lot of overlap. I'm pretty much going to answer that together. So I think a great leader is someone who is d- first and foremost doing the work. I don't know any great mm-hmm. leaders who are not doing the work, who do not approach things with a growth mindset where they do not think that they're done. Well, that's fine. I'm the CEO. Everything's done. I've learned everything I need to learn. No more development for me. It's not that, (laughs) right? It really is. They're doing the work. There's an extremely deep level of self-awareness and self-insight. So it's not just, hey, I know these things about myself, but it's, hey, I know these things about myself. And here's the things I'm working on. And here's where they're coming from. And here's when and how this shows up and all of that all of those aspects of it. I think that's really important. A a really great leader is transparent. And it doesn't mean, you know, Brene Brown talks about this with her dare to lead stuff. It doesn't mean oversharing. It doesn't mean vulnerability is not, let me tell you all the crap I'm dealing with in this moment, but it is sharing appropriately 
And transparency is that exact yeah. thing. It is vulnerable and sharing appropriately so that the people around you don't feel unstable. They don't feel like you're unpredictable. They don't feel like they can't come to you if something comes up. Because when you are transparent in that way, people can approach you. They feel like they can come and talk to you. And so I think those are really important. I think some of the qualities that go along with that is um, a really deep commitment to listening, to understand, not mm -hmm. listening to react or respond, right? Like not listening because I'm going to argue my point with you because then I'm only listening for the things that you're saying that are, that are about my point. So I can be like, well, actually this is the thing. No, 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 no. It's not that right. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It's not about me. It doesn't make a difference if I get to say a thing. The point of listening is that I'm going to understand you and look <laughs> the great side effect long-term that helps you influence that person because you get to know them. You get to know what drives them. So guess what? Yes, it's a win yes. for you in the long term. Mm -hmm but it's so hard in the moment to put our egos aside. So a great leader really does understand the importance of listening, knows that it's not an end game. You are not suddenly a master of listening. You're not, you're going to be working at it constantly because people are yeah. different and they're going to challenge you in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that along going along with that is the truly the best leaders I know can put their ego aside mm -hmm. inside of the situations they step into. It's not That's about good. what's yeah. best for me. It's not about what's best for me. It's about what's best for us. Mm. I think a great leader never forgets that. So they share information with the intention, what's best for us, what's best for the company, what's best for this team, right? They're, you know, they approach difficult conversations with what's good, what's the best outcome for us, for this company, for this team, and when you can take your ego out of it, which is really hard because we are taught, you know, we're very individualistic and there's a lot of wonderful things inside of that, but there's also challenges that come with that focus being like, you know, bashed into our brain from the time that we start junior kindergarten. Man. Fascinating. You mentioned something, um, a really interesting point that I haven't heard a lot of people talk about, and it's the difference between transparency and vulnerability. Can you explain um, what that looks like for you? So vulnerability is, um, God, I wish I had Brene Brown's actual definition in front of me because it's so nice to be like, well, here's a vulnerability <laughs> researcher who's who talks about this, but I do not. So I think how I would explain the difference is that um, transparency is sharing information in an appropriate way at an appropriate time as much as the audience can handle. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that, if, you know, if you are, um, if you're one-on-one -on -one with someone versus standing in front of a company of 5,000 people, the message has to be appropriate for them, for the whatever the audience in, is and whoever the audience is. And it has to be in such a way that you might know, you might not be able to share the details of a merger and acquisition with everyone. That's okay. It's, it, it's okay that you can't share those details, but you can potentially say, you know, we're in the midst of making some changes and we're going to give you the information as soon as we're able about what's going on. But I want to reassure everyone that, you know, there's no, nothing is, you know, no one's job is going to be affected or whatever the reassurance is. So transparency is really about giving people the information that they need in the timeliest manner possible. And I think vulnerability is more about sharing about yourself and what you're going through in a way that, that, you know, isn't scary to them, isn't oversharing, isn't putting the onus on them to help you process something. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, when I think about it, transparency is really about other people yeah. and things that affect them versus what I'm going through or what I'm dealing with. That is a great definition. It's not something that a lot of people talk about, but when it comes to leadership, it is unbelievably crucial. And I think for the record, I think both skill sets are vital, vital uh, for leaders to have. And I think that it's sometimes easier for, uh, especially in big organizations, it can be easier to, to do one or the other, which is why I often, I, you know, I have a tendency to kind of talk to both of them and not just separate one or the other out because I think they're both really important. 
Mm, that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, so when it comes, you're going to take this in a different direction. When it comes to maintaining high performance in the long run, what do you see as one of the biggest challenges for most people? Um, besides burnout these days, because I think that's a, that's a real thing right now. Um, I think that, and, and I say that a little bit flippantly, but it's real, right? Like I think a lot of people in general, but this year especially are really struggling with burnout and decision fatigue and mental exhaustion. And and it's not being addressed in a really um, timely manner. Um, So I think that is something that we need to be more aware of and have more of a conversation around. Um, But I think some of the challenges around high performance are we often don't actually define what that is for ourselves or for a team or for others. So if we're not defining what high performance really is, if we're not def- if we're not clear what that looks like or if slash how we measure it or what we're looking for, then how are we having a real conversation about what a high performing team looks like? Like, and I say this as someone, it's on my website. My website is in the middle of being redone. It's going to be on my website even more because I get there's a marketing aspect to it and it makes people come and go, Ooh, I want a team that performs really highly. I want to be a high performing leader, but I can tell you that I don't do any of that work with anyone before we're clear on what that is. Because I think the, one of the biggest detriments that has happened to leaders and leadership in the leadership development world is putting forward the language around performance coaching and I'm a high performer and blah, 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 without defining it. And, you know, no dig on any specific coaches or leaders out there who do that. I get it, but it's meaningless if we don't know what we're looking for. That is such a fantastic answer. You're absolutely right. High performance has been one of those things that people throw around flippantly without actually deciding on, okay, this is what we're going to talk about. And to what you said earlier, where your high performance for today could look completely different than high performance last week. If today I'm struggling going through so much more. I have to take on so much more work. Well, can you imagine at the beginning, you know, the beginning of 2020, what we thought a high performing leader, or high performing team looks like versus what we think it looks like now. Totally if we're different. St- totally. Yeah. Di- like what a disservice we do if we're still running on that old paradigm and we haven't given people the space to do the best they can do in the moment, mm. to be the best they can be in the moment whatever that looks like. That's so good. Mm. Uh, Obviously you work with businesses, you work with individuals uh, that, you know, might be CEOs and different people, um, entrepreneurs and whatnot. What are some of the like common reoccurring problems that you've noticed with with all these different people that you've worked with and how would you go about helping fix those different problems that you've noticed? So I think that's a really interesting question because a lot of it is dependent on the organization they're in. So I Mm. work with a number of teams And I will say that there are definitely themes that come up in specific organizations. So sometimes it's easier to speak to that. I will say that probably in my experience, and I, you know, there are people out there for sure who have different experience, obviously different experience than I do. But one of the things that I think comes up almost with almost everyone is a a resistance to conflict, a resistance to um, and healthy conflict, a resistance to difficult conversations, a resistance to whatever you want to call that, you know, rumbling as Brene Brown puts it like there, you know, radical candor as Kim Scott puts it, like everyone has a language around this, but there is so much resistance. I don't care if they're an entrepreneur, if they're a business owner, if they are a new leader, if they're an experienced leader, the resistance to, having those difficult conversations is I, I it's probably the thing I talk to that and f- giving and receiving feedback are probably the two most consist- consistent things I talk to people about mm, yeah. all the time. And here's, you know, you asked like, how do you solve that? Right. That was a sort of the second part of the question. And he, here's the really um, disappointing answer time and work and consistency and challenging beliefs around why you're avoiding conflict and giving them new paradigms for how to step into that and how to have those conversations that work for them. So a lot of it becomes really dependent on where they're at in the process. Wow. Huh. 
That's crazy. So it really is. I mean, obviously the responsibility is on them to make that change ultimately. It has to be. So here's the fun thing about if like when I'm doing coaching, I think the, the, and I'm going to and you know, I, again, no dig on anyone personal, but I think that there are, there's a bit of a misnomer around coaching sometimes, especially if you're used to talking around business coaches. Cause I think there's lots of people who call themselves business coaches who are offering you a paradigm that has worked for them that they have implemented that has solved their problem. And they're really trainers and there's nothing wrong with that. I want to be clear. That is a, we need that. We need information. If they're solving people's problems, that's great. But when I'm doing executive or leadership or business coaching, I'm not going in there going, my way is the right yeah. way. Y'all have to listen to me and just do exactly what I'm telling you. It is a process of discovery. I mean, I'd be a billionaire if I could figure yes, that out. Seriously. That worked for everyone and just want to, that's not real. <laughs> that's so like, why, why is that not real? I hear what you're saying there. That's um, you know, it's really about going in and partnering with them on the process and figuring out what's going to work with you. And I'm a big believer in running small experiments. So let's try this out. Let's see how this feels. If you're not doing, if you're, let's figure, but it's not, it doesn't make a difference what works for me. I will tell you stories in the process of coaching about here's how I've overcome this. And here's where I can see, and here's how some other people I've worked with but let's find out what works for you because it does not matter if it worked mm, for someone yeah. else. It doesn't matter. Yeah, that's, that's so good. You said that one of the biggest things that you help coach people through is uh, essentially their paradigm and their perspective on conflict, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's fascinating that you say that because the more I've been thinking about it, every, almost every single person I know has a, in myself included, has some form of dysfunction, a dysfunctional paradigm and view of conflict, whether that's from how they grew up, from work, doesn't matter. Um, so my question is, have you? Uh, ha what has your paradigm for conflict looked like, and how has that changed over the last couple, uh, the last years of coaching? Um, so my paradigm of I grew up um, with parents who are not afraid of conflict. They interesting. They, they were not afraid of conflict. So that's really um, good. That's good. Well, it was not always the healthy version of conflict. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let's be clear. Uh, but not they were afraid not afraid to put up a good fight, right? That's right. That's right. So um, they were, you know, my parents were almost 20 years apart in age difference. They came from two different countries, both immigrated to Canada separately as adults. So we didn't have family. We have no, I still don't have, I mean, my parents are about that and I don't have family mm -hmm. here, right? So like it, they were, in a strange, you know, bubble a little bit. Um, and both of them were fiercely independent and so stubborn. This sounds so, like a great cocktail of things. This is going to oh, be fun. Yeah. So there was, there was a lot of conflict. They, they fought, they uh, resolved. Um, they, there was, you know, my mother was Italian and was loud. So there was some yelling and some throwing of, you know, wooden <laughs> spoons at me as I chased down a hall. It's a real My thing. My family's Italian. I completely understand. Yep. Yeah. So it was, we were not, and despite the fact that my father was English and grew up in a time where like his siblings, I love them, but they were much more conflict avoidant. My father was definitely the rebel who was like, mm, no, I, if I have a different opinion, let's get into it. So Conflict was not avoided in my house. It was not dealt with in healthy ways necessarily. It wasn't always resolved in the best ways possible. And there was a lot of it that was about me proving myself. So one of the other things I will say, and this I will get to the point of this, but you know, my parents were really big on making sure that I could question anything and promoting independence. Yeah. Wow. That was a that was a huge thing super uncommon with my father's generation, especially. But so my father was born right after the first world war, grew up in London as you know, men were not coming home from the, from the front lines and then were off again in the second world war. And he saw what happened to women who were not able to survive on their own without a man base at that time to support them. And he saw the struggles and he was like, not my daughter, mm -hmm. that is never happening. So Anything a boy could do, I could do. Anything that that like, it was possible, I was encouraged to do it. So super independent, always questioning things. Everything was a discussion. So 
any opinion in the house was a discussion. So I grew up with a very particular pair. It's, it's super annoying to people who didn't grow up with me, to grow up like me. I know this now because I will, que- I'm, I will question everything. Everything's a discussion. I have the Italian, like, let's get real passionate. And they're like, what, what is how, what is, what is, and I'm like, no, 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 this is, we're fine. This is just, we're discussing. I don't understand. 100%. But the shift has been to, to move through, move out of it being about me being right and be about, what are we learning here? What's the best outcome? How do I step into it in a healthy way? Because I didn't always step into conflict in a healthy way because my parents didn't. So how can I step into something in a way that is productive as opposed to reductive? I think that is probably the biggest change. And I'll give you a super quick example. I got on a call today with someone who I don't know, and it was just a like get to know you sort of interviewee type thing, really 15 minutes. And in the first three minutes, she got very aggressive, like real short with me, was making a bunch of assumptions and really aggressive. And I literally, I took a deep breath and I was like, listen, this feels like a very aggressive beginning to this call. I'm not sure if I'm missing something or something has happened, but I don't know that this is a great place to continue from. And she was like, I'm really sorry. I just got off a really rough call. Um, I shouldn't have taken out on you. Let's start over. Started much more conversationally. And at the end of the call, she was like, I want to apologize for that. Um, And the way you handled it was exactly what I needed. Wow. What a great way to navigate that seriously. And uh, people don't do that, by the way. People give up on those conversations so quick or they fight fire with fire. I've noticed at least. Right. That's amazing. And you get, it builds resentment. It's so easy to build resentment and miscommunication in those moments because it's scary to say, let just open that front door and be like, Hey, this seems like a thing I'm seeing. Is this? <laughs> That's so, wow. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. And I mean, it, being such emotional creatures, you know, we really are, it's so hard not to respond emotionally in so many different ways. And um, so, all right, now I have another question for you. Now, this, this is regarding culture, because obviously you are a genius when it comes to building culture in organizations and groups and different uh, kinds of people you work with. So can you kind of talk that through with us? What does, what's the importance of building culture? What does that look like? How do you go about that? Just kind of give it to us. Well, the importance of building culture is super simple. It doesn't make a difference if you build it or if you don't, it's happening. Love it. So either you get to you get to have a hand in it and design your culture like create culture by design or it's going to happen by default and many of us have had the experience of working in organizations i would say most of us if you've worked in an organization have had the experience of working in a place where the culture was the afterthought or the culture was like here's a bunch of values on the wall i don't know why i'm pointing at my books here's a bunch Those of values, values on the I'm wall sure. when you walk into, <laughs> into the these are my here's you know you walk into the lobby and here's all the values this is what we live by and that's that's culture that's how we're defining culture and that's not actually the lived experience of people and so that lived experience is happening because you have people in your organization who are living and breathing this so either you get to build that and design it with them or it's going to happen and you're going to have especially as leaders you're going to have no control over it and you're going to have no say in it so I firmly believe in taking the opportunity to have those conversations, to build the culture, to make it the lived experience, not just a bunch of ideals. I talk about this when I talk about values with individuals and organizations. I do not give a crap what your aspirational values are. I don't care what you would like your values to be. If you are not making decisions from those values, if you are not living into them every single day, they're not real. I don't care. Love that. Come on. Come That's on. Awesome. When are you running for office? <laughs> <laughs> Straight up though. That's fantastic. I mean, it'd be in Canada, so I don't know how useful that would be. <laughs> I'm sure it'd be very useful considering that you're our neighbor right now in the U.S. Valid. Right, right. So I want to take this into an interesting term. From everything that I've heard today, it's very clear that you put a lot of work in personal development. Um, And you can even take a look at the books behind you. Um, That's also very clear. You put a lot of work into personal development. So what are some of the books, maybe conferences, what are some of the things that's helped you grow the most? So I will say the book that um, changed 
my life, if you like. I mean, it feels like a big thing to say, but it was the first book I read where I was like, oh, okay. There's more to this than what I thought previously. Um, and I read it I, 14, 15 years ago now. So it's been a while. Uh, was The Four Agreements I have not read um, that by Don Miguel Ruiz. I just read that um, a couple months ago. It, incredible. It is, I have made so many leaders read it and it's so simple. And I'm like, listen, it's short, it's simple. It's going to feel real basic. But if you actually take into account what he's saying and what he's writing about, the concepts are life-changing. And the problem is we don't often do that. So I talk a lot about with, you know, one of the things I end up talking about with my leaders and, and when we're, you know, doing culture work, leadership development, whatever it is, is not running from assumptions. Mm -hmm. One of his key tenets, this is 15 years in and I still talk about assumptions nonstop because we are built, it's human beings, we are built to make assumptions and move forward from crappy data. So one of his things mm -hmm. is, you know, don't make assumptions. Yeah. It's so basic. It's so basic and it is yeah. so hard for people to do. So you know, I would say that's one of the, that's one of the books that ha that completely changed my lens on things with four, it's just four things, four key things, four takeaways, super easy. Um, I would say, listen, I love Brene Brown. I think that she's brilliant. And I think that the key book, in my opinion, and I think she says this at one point to read is Dare to yeah. Lead because it's like all of her research put together in sort of the most applicable yeah. way. And so I think that is really, I think that's a really powerful book. Um, there's a Canadian writer. His book's only a few years old. I'm going to get it wrong. Oh no, I'm going to get it right. I got it. Came to my head. Um, it's called The Coaching Habit and it's Michael Bungay Steiner, I believe is his name. And he breaks down the concept of coaching and coaching conversations in a super, super simplistic way that any leader can use the structure of a coaching conversation effectively. And that's a game changer for leaders, in my opinion. I'm um, adding that book to my Audible tonight. Thank you. It's good. Yeah, no, it's, he has a new one as well. I haven't read it yet. I, I bought it. I just haven't read it yet, um, which I imagine is also going to be, I think it's the something trap. I don't remember, but no, I was going to say the thirst trap. It's not the thirst trap. <laughs> it's... <laughs> It's a different type of trap, um, but his stuff is great. And then in terms of conferences, I, a lot of the conferences that I've been to um, that have had a big impact on me were really more um, about the connections I made at the, at the event, because it was really like an event for entrepreneurs or an event for um, visionaries, quote unquote, things like that. And it was less the content and more the quality of the connections and people. Oh and so I would challenge that any event that you go to, any conference you go to, you can find those people. And that should be, if you go in saying, I'm going to find some of my people, I, that's literally my intention. I, it's my friend. I have people that I work with who see me at lots of these things who are like, it, you're so hilarious because you will be like, I'm going to be friends with that person and I'm going to be friends with that person and I'm going to be friends with that person and I will that's walk awesome. out being friends with those people. Um, and because that to me is like, that's success. If I don't learn anything new from the conference, if it, that's fine because there's growth in those relationships and that's the most important thing to me. Also for the record, uh, Liz Gilbert and um, uh, nope, forgot it. And there's another guy. Those are my next people. And that at some point I will be friends with them. I'm just going to Adam Grant, Liz there. Gilbert, Liz Gilbert, Adam Grant. At some point I will be friends with them. hundred percent. If y'all are listening, <laughs> you, saw, you saw the, pro the proclamation. You heard it here first. So okay. that's right. What about your book? I, I've been searching all over the internet for your book and I cannot find it. Where is your book? I need to know this question. Uh, it is not written yet. I have, I have two outlines. Of, I, this is true fact. I have two outlines of books written. Yeah. And I have not actually sat down to write the content out fully yet, which is, um, you know, shameful. And also, thank you for, <laughs> for thinking that you would like to read anything I wrote. Oh, I really no, appreciate I'm that. I 100%. I would as well. Yeah, no, I would I, no, be so I'm not excited saying that. that. I'm being serious. I was actually looking online for your book because after watching all of these different podcasts, I was like, holy crap, this woman is amazing. I'm like, she obviously has a book. And I was like looking everywhere. I went on Facebook, everything. And I'm just like, 
She doesn't have a book. I don't oh have a goodness. book. So do me a favor. I don't. Please take some time out of 2021. Yes. And write your freaking book. Okay. I will. And then I'll come back to promote it on your podcast. How's that sound? hundred percent. You're always welcome. hundred <laughs> percent. We'll have percent. you back. hundred percent. Right. So we'll hop into another question. So uh, you got time for a few more questions? Yeah, I'm not, I've got, other than you might hear a yelling cat at some point, I got That's nothing. Awesome. All right. So um, obviously you're really incredible at putting yourself um, in other people's shoes, which I think is a very, very difficult skill for people to acquire. Um, can you kind of just share about the importance of that and maybe how to maybe practice learning how to do that better? So, I mean, I don't know that I can overemphasize the importance of being able to put yourself in other people's shoes with a caveat. Putting yourself in someone else's shoes is not, you know, if someone else is, if, if I'm talking to someone and they are really depressed and really struggling and just can't get themselves out of bed or whatever the case may be, me putting myself in their shoes so I'm feeling that way does n- is not empowering for me or for them. But me being able to empathize with that and understand them and not try to solve that is really the important thing. And I think that, you know, I had the benefit of growing up in a place, in a house and in a situation where I could question everything and, you know, seeking to understand the other person and the other situation because also the default in my house was, you know, if I didn't understand enough and I was trying to argue my point without understanding, my father especially was like, we're done. Yeah. We're not, you're not listening. So I was put in that position really, you know, very consistently. But I think we too often jump into those assumptions of, oh, you know, I know how you're feeling because I was sad once. I know how you're feeling mm-hmm. because, you know, my parent died. That, that I mean, that was a big thing when my you know, my mom died a couple of years ago and the number of people who thought they were being empathetic or understanding because they were telling me their story. That's a big miss. That's not putting yourself in yeah. someone else's shoes, but there, it's a real no, thing that it's, it's I've experienced on that side of, Yeah. right? Where it's like, you, you just saying, I'm, I'm really sorry for your loss. You know, can I send you some food? Can I, you know, is there anything you want to talk about? How are you handling it? Just asking them questions, whether it's of if you don't know them well, you know, can I help in some way? Can I send you something? If you know them well, like, how are you handling things? Is there anything that you need? You know, how is, you know, what's today been like? Um, what are you finding? Ch- whatever the case may be, but it's really asking them and working to understand them. That's the best way we can put ourselves in someone else's shoes is not assuming that their experience is our experience. Yeah. And that is really hard for people to do. Yeah. That's so, that's, yeah. thank you for sharing that, by the way. That's something I think I even needed to hear for myself. That was really, really good. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So with that, um, this actually, this next question, I wasn't planning on asking it, but I'm going to run with it because it, it kind of ties into a whole bunch of things you've said. Um, talking about active listening, talking about a lot of personal growth and talking about conflict, a lot of things that... And, empathizing with people, a lot of things that other people, most people find uncomfortable, right? Most people find it difficult to do. Um, And this is stuff you teach. So my question for you is, when was the last time you were uncomfortable? And what did that look like? And feel free to answer that however you want. I mean, I would, you know, full disclosure, stepping into a conversation with this woman where within two minutes, I was calling her on some pretty shitty behavior today that was uncomfortable it's still not it's not comfortable for me to be like um this sucks Mm -hmm. and i also know that if i don't do that then i'm not going to be able to be my best self in that call uh it's going to make me feel resentful or defensive because i feel like she's on the attack so you know i was uncomfortable today stepping into that Um, I get into calls with leaders on a regular basis that make Mm -hmm. me uncomfortable. Um, Sometimes it's because like, it's because of the, the, how, how, like what they're talking about in terms of like things I don't know about or things I don't have experience with where it's like, oh crap. Um, And I also know that when that happens, I ask for context. Like what the, I have people I work with who they'll joke, they'll tell me something and I'll, I'll do like a deep breath and pause. Cause I'll have that moment of like, I feel like I'm out of my depth. Like, I feel like I, what is happening here? And my go-to is to take a breath and be like, okay, so 
I'm going to ask for a little bit more context around this because I don't have enough information. Mm -hmm. And I have some defaults now that when I am uncomfortable, that I lean in and I almost inevitably ask a question, which is really annoying if you're friends with me, because it means that when you're telling me something or you're complaining about something or something's challenging, my I'm not like, oh, that sucks so much. Let's I'm like, so wow. tell me what yeah. you mean by that, which drives <laughs> people it, bananas. Though. I love it. That's um, good. That's but it's helpful. It's yeah. helpful. Yeah. Yeah. But I would say like that, you know, I'm uncomfortable on a regular basis. And I also, I love that. I am going to be honest with you. I love it because there's so much growth in being uncomfortable and I am more committed to continuing to grow and see new blind spots and get better as a human um, with the impact I can have in this world, with the work I, I'm doing, with anything that is happening. I'm more committed to that growth than I That's am so to being good. comfortable. Yeah, I love that. Come on. That's what I'm talking about. That gets me so excited. That is, so, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. Um, Okay, we got two questions left. This one, as of most of the questions we've asked today, is going to be a completely in left field. But Love we, it. we always like to end our interviews with these last two questions. So this one, imagine that you are in your last days, right? You're on your deathbed. You have your friends, your close friends, your close family. They come by, right? What is the one piece of advice you're going to leave them with? Please take your time. Oh, I'm going to. Um, I think the one thing, the one piece of advice that I would leave them with is that, is to remember that your story is not everyone else's story and that your beliefs are not everyone else's belief, everyone else's beliefs and that your experience is not everyone else's experience. And it is really hard as human beings that are stuck inside this one head this is it. This is all I got. What's in here? It's really easy for me to convince myself that mine is the only way. Mine is the right story. Mine is the best story. Mine is the most meaningful story. And that is just not real. And I would love for more people to um, understand that all that does is create divide and mm -hmm. conflict, not the healthy yeah. kind um and suppression and violence and oppression and all of that stuff the more we do that the more we have of that the more we can say each person is entitled to have their beliefs and story and value what they value and be who they are then the more we actually create connection and the more um we create understanding man oh that's so good i i, I love this that was yeah, like a breath of fresh that was air. Beautiful. To hear that. Please write that in your book. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, that's how it oh should my end. Thank you. That's well, amazing. with that being said, I, I really wish that we had some more time to ask more questions. Um, but the final question that we have for you is, you know, what's next for you? Can you kind of share about what, what does it look like exiting 2020 and then going into 2021? Well, I've clearly just committed to writing a book in 2021. So that <laughs> at least one, if not we two. have achieved our goals. That's <laughs> all that matters. Thank you. Uh, much appreciated. Um, I think that I, besides writing a book, um, there's a few, there's one, there's, you know, a few programs I want to create that reach more people. So it's not just reliant on me or my team doing one-on-ones. Um, that's more accessible price point wise. It's more accessible, you know, less of, of my time or their time. I, that's definitely a piece of it. I hope I can travel somewhere in 2021. That would be really nice. My family, I would like to wow, see my family. Cool. They're all in Europe. So, and they're like in Italy, which is uh, not great right now. Yeah. So um, I'd like to travel and see my family. That would be nice. Um, and I, you know, I really would just like to I just like to do more of the things like these kinds of conversations, doing this kind of stuff that's just fun and creative and lets me lean on all of those books that I've read, you know, in a way that's not me trying to remember the details of them because that's not real for my brain. But like 
this is creative and fun and I enjoy this sort of thing. So hopefully more of this in That's 2021. Awesome. And hey, if anyone would like to introduce me to Liz Gilbert or Adam Grant, I will. I would like some new friends. I'm into that also. That's awesome. 2021. That's, that's when that's going to happen. <laughs> well, guys, we just uh, we're so excited that you uh, you're viewing in on this uh, awesome, awesome show with Celine and uh, Miss Williams. We just want to say thank you again so much for coming on, and uh, just want to also remind all of our viewers that we're going to put all of your links in the description below. Thank you so much for coming on and being with us tonight. This has been absolutely an honor. Thank you for having me. It was great. It was really nice chatting with you guys. Thank you.